In 2011, I attended an invite-only event called Opening the Kimono, hosted by five-time New York Times bestselling author Tim Ferriss. It was an event geared towards authors who had the desire to become bestsellers, and at the time, I had absolutely no desire to even write a book, let alone become a bestselling author. And the cost of admission for that event, if accepted, was $10,000 US. Now, that investment was easily 20 times more than anything I've ever paid to go to an event prior to that. And my friends thought I was crazy for even considering it and that I'd never see the return. However, I had this gut feeling that with such a high advertised price, there were bound to be some really interesting people in attendance. At the end of the two days of the event, my friends on some level were right. I mean, the content from the event didn't benefit me per se, but I did meet some really great people. Folks I definitely wouldn't have connected with otherwise. In September of 2012, less than two weeks after my rock bottom incident on the highway that I talked about in season one, episode one, Michelle, someone who I met at that OTK event a little over a year prior, posted on Facebook that she had an extra ticket to go see Seth Godin in New York. Now, I've been a huge fan of Seth's for a long time, and I had no other obligations at the time, so I decided to jump at the opportunity. And Seth's event was, it was cute. It was this cute, quaint event held at the Helen's Mills Theater in New York with just a little over 100 creatives and entrepreneurs in attendance. And on day two of the event, Seth did a six hour Q&A, which to me showcased his brilliance far more than any talk could. Midway through his Q&A, he shared a story about a gentleman named Thornton May to demonstrate the value of being a catalyst connecting like-minded individuals. Enter Seth. All right, there's a character named Thornton May. Thornton is a great guy, the kind of person who knows more than almost anyone you know and wears a bow tie and pulls it off. And uh, Thornton, for a while, was the business development guy at what was the fastest growing IT consulting firm in the country. This was before the internet. And Thornton understood early on that the entire business was built on 500 people becoming their customers. The CIO of the Fortune 500, that those 500 people would determine whether they were going to win or not. And he realized that those 500 people were disconnected and lonely. That if you're the CIO of Texaco or uh, General Motors, you don't know any other CIOs. You can't talk to your spouse, can't talk to your boss, can't talk to your employees about the challenges that you face. So what Thornton would do was identify a city, find five or six or ten CIOs and say, look, I'd love to take you to breakfast with these other CIOs. I'll just be there to pay the check. You guys meet each other and you can talk about what you're up to. And in every city, and I went to one of them, you know, 10 people would show up eagerly because the thought of meeting the other CIOs in their town was too good an opportunity to pass up. And Thornton had enough credibility to earn the privilege of inviting them. And what would happen at each, each of these breakfasts is about halfway through the breakfast, someone would say to someone else, blah, 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 blah. And then they turn to Thornton and say, do your guys know how to help us with this problem? And Thornton would just write it down in a little notebook and follow up later. And one by one by one, the CIOs all understood that this posture that Thornton was taking, this posture of unrelentless generosity with no upside for him, was the way the firm was acting. And that led them to retaining the company. And it ended up becoming a, a huge uh, nine-figure business, largely on the basis of his ability to weave together a network of people who wanted to be connected. I sat with this story on the flight home and for several days afterwards. And coincidentally, I felt incredibly isolated at the time as an entrepreneur. And I really started to kind of dream up this idea of starting something called Mastermind Dinners. Dinners designed to connect successful entrepreneurs from various different industries. And I had a strong gut feeling between you and I that I might weasel my way out of this idea. So I decided I need to get it on the calendar as soon as possible. And I booked a private dining room within a couple days of landing back home. 
And I chose to go with a private space at the Spoke Club in Toronto specifically for those of you who are based in the city, as I knew that intimacy was really the key to deep connections. And I really want to steer clear of the general noise of a restaurant. Leading up to the dinner, I was filled with doubts. I mean, what if they think this is a waste of their time? What if they think this is a stupid idea? The negative self-talk grew stronger and stronger as the dinner date grew closer and closer, up until the point where I was sitting at the restaurant two hours before the dinner and just incredibly close to canceling it. But given the fact that it was so close to showtime, I felt like I had to fulfill my promise and, and go through with the dinner. And getting close to 6 p.m., I mean, I, I remember vividly, guests started to slowly kind of trickle in one by one. We all met at the bar first, and then when the entire group arrived, and to my surprise, we actually didn't have any last-minute cancellations, I took everyone into our private room. There, I sat everyone down, I took drink orders, and had everyone around the table introduce themselves. This is something I no longer do, and I explain why in the Becoming a Catalyst episode in this season. I was so nervous and so shaky that I was just in my head the entire time. Thankfully, once introductions were done, conversations started to blossom on their own effortlessly, and I easily said less than anyone else at the table, in part because I was so bloody nervous, but also because the dinner wasn't about me. It was about them. At that dinner, two things became very clear to me. First was that the power of uncommon commonalities. Listen, we all have a deep desire to be connected to like-minded individuals, and because everyone at that dinner was curated by me in advance, ultimately, they all shared a few deep commonalities. The second thing that I discovered was that hosting people energized me. I mean, seeing people hit it off and share experiences and resources and connections in order to help one another gave me an incredible level of fulfillment and still does to this day. At the end of the night, I remember smiling from ear to ear. I mean, conversation went on for over four hours and didn't skip a beat. It was a success in my books. An important side note to add is that the common misconception about me is that I've always had this great, fantastic network, and this couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, a few months prior to that first dinner, I got married and had a bachelor party. I had two people show up, my brother and my brother-in-law. That's it. All my best and deepest relationships have come in the last 48 months. So with that said, over this entire season, I will share everything I know. I'm pulling no punches. I'm giving you the full playbook and really kind of share step-by-step -step the path from knowing nobody to being one of Forbes' top networkers to watch in less than three years. Now, getting back to reality over the weeks that followed that dinner, I mean, I continued to vet new potential business ideas to pull me out of that financial mess that I was in. I thought of businesses in the online education space. I thought of about wanting to become a speaker. I thought of being an online marketing consultant. My GoDaddy account became a graveyard of hundreds of domains and failed business ideas. And as I was waiting for the right idea to hit me, one thing I chose to do was try my best to continue holding these dinners. Now, financially, it made absolutely no sense to do because I was paying out of pocket for every single one of them, and I didn't know how I was going to make rent the following month. My wife and I were living on these American Express gift cards to keep us afloat, which we actually bought using credit card points before my credit cards got cut off. So my peers thought I was crazy, and rightfully so. My reasoning at the time was that I was so close to bankruptcy that the bank could take my car, they could take whatever measly assets I had left, but they couldn't take my relationships. Investing in myself and investing in my relationships were the safest investments I could make. This was true back then, and it's still true today. A little more than a month later, on November 15th, 2012 to be exact, I stumbled across a blog post by Tim Ferriss called the All You Can Eat Campaign of Goodness. It was a, I guess you could say like a rally cry of sorts as his soon to be released book, The 4-Hour Chef, was banned from virtually all retail distribution. In his words, Last week, Ina Garten's Barefoot Contessa Foolproof Recipes You Can Trust sold roughly 66,000 books through BookScan. If you walk into Barnes & Noble, you will likely see walls of her books, which her publisher has paid for, just like Coca-Cola pays for the first 50 feet of Walmart placement. 
I don't have an issue with that. This is how the publishing game has worked for a very long time. But to compete with monolithic forces that are banning my book due to my publisher, Amazon Publishing, thousands of bookstores, including all Barnes & Noble, I can't play their game. I have to do things differently. It's the red coats versus the colonies, and I must take attack using different means. The New York Times bestseller list is highly skewed towards print retail. This makes it a hard target for me, though I'm still gunning for it. No matter, I want to hit number one book scan to send a message to the incumbent world of publishing, to those who want everything to remain in the 1900s. If The 4-Hour Chef wins, in any capacity, authors will feel freedom to experiment. If this book fails because the old guard makes an example out of me, their message wins. Don't mess with the system that keeps us fat and happy or we'll punish you. Enter the All You Can Eat campaign of goodness. This is a sniper shot directed at the heart of every member of publishing. Those who care more about their parking spot at the country club than their end user, the reader. To attempt something different, I recruited a small cadre of companies to make you an offer that defy belief. I hope you enjoy them. Buy three books. Get an exclusive two-hour Q&A, an 850-page PDF of full interview scripts, and three months of Evernote Premium. If you buy 25 books, you get a Kindle Fire, a Breville Control Grip Immersion Blender, and everything mentioned prior. At the bottom of the page, if you scroll down, you can see this. Buy 4,000 books. Limit one person. I will give you two 60-minute keynotes at venues of your choice in the U.S. or Canada, timing and content to be mutually agreed upon. Interested in this package? Words fail me. I've fallen and I can't get up. There's only one of these slots up for grabs. Fill out this page. All offers expire at 5 p.m. PST this Saturday, November 17th. As soon as I saw this post, I thought of a good friend of mine named Scott, who was the co-owner of a great business events company called The Art Of. They host large events for 1,000 to 3,000 attendees, so I thought they could not only benefit from having Tim, but it could also leverage the books given the scale of their events. The second I click send on that email to him that morning, I thought this could really be a great opportunity for anyone, as Tim doesn't generally speak all that often, plus he's never spoken in Canada from what I understand. Given that he was only offering the single package, I ended up emailing him directly that morning, less than two hours after he made that post, and I told him I'd take the package. The obstacle was that I had to come up with $84,000 in less than two days, as the post was made on the 15th, and the order needed to be placed by the 17th. This was a terrifying proposition for me as I had never raised money before in my life. All my past businesses were built off credit cards. Plus, I was raised with the belief that you should always do things on your own and never ask for help. But for me, past experience told me that nothing focuses the mind like crushing debt. So I knew I would find the way. For the months leading up to that moment, I had chosen really comfort over courage, and I had stopped doing the very things that made me successful in the first place, leveraging eustress. Distress or stress refers to harmful stimuli that makes you weaker, less confident, and less able. Eustress, on the other hand, pulls us up from the lethargy and inaction. It, it excites us, it, it challenges us, it gives us hope and inspires us to take constructive action. Role models who push us to exceed our limits, physical training that remove our spare tires and risk that expand our sphere of comfortable action are examples of eustress. Stress that is healthful and stimulus for growth. There is no progress without eustress, and the more eustress we can create and apply to our lives, the sooner we can actualize our dreams. It's the initiating part of the process that gets us from where we are to where we want to be. In my ticketing business, I lived in a state of eustress. I would take these big leaps on a monthly basis with no clear path of how I was going to make ends meet. I mean, I'd buy $250,000 of inventory on a credit card with repayment due at the end of the month with zero balance in our business bank account. For some reason, I knew I would always find a way to come through. And as an entrepreneur, I've always known that I work best with my back against the wall. So committing to those 4,000 books, although terrifying for me at the time, was, was really my shot. That morning, I sent out a quick email to three friends. 
Uh, the first one, I want to talk about numbers uh, and projections. And although this was workable, I've, I've never been a numbers guy. Add to the fact that <laughs> I had absolutely no event experience. I was sitting on a business idea that was only a few hours old. I knew I probably wouldn't be able to convince him to invest in the next 48 hours. The second person I reached out to was interested and wanted to potentially start a business that was 50-50. And that was something I was actually totally interested in. But I told him, you know, I don't have a ton of time to hash it out, but I'm going to loop back with you. I have one more person to call. The third person I reached out to said, swing by my CFO's house in the morning and pick up a check. No business plan, no signed agreements, not even a conversation around repayment terms. I hung up that phone as quickly as I could to eliminate any possibility that he would change his mind. And I rushed over and picked up that check the following morning. I ran to the bank, made the deposit, and I wired the money to Tim. Now, to be clear, I never thought I would be in the event space. I mean, I simply saw this as an opportunity to do what I did in those dinners, but on a larger scale. Also, it would keep me focused on something that was like five, six months into the future because up until that point, I was spiraling into a, a bad place, like not even thinking six hours ahead, let alone six months ahead. I knew that if I could keep busy on a project, I would buy myself some time to eventually come up with what my next business would be. Months later, after overcoming many obstacles along the way, we hosted our first Mastermind Talks event. To everyone's surprise, including mine, it was a big success, and there's many reasons for that, but I fundamentally believe that sometimes ignorance, confidence, and hard work can go a long way when you're an entrepreneur. Because I had no clue of what I was doing, and I was flying by the seat of my pants, I wasn't limited to the standard way of planning an event. I didn't know the rules or the traditional limitations. One of the highlights for me of that experience was a testimonial that somebody left that read, Mastermind Talks felt like an enlightening two-day-long dinner party in good company. This sentiment brought a smile to my face as it brought me back to think about the humble beginnings of our Mastermind dinners. Months after we executed on the event, I started thinking more and more about my friend that lent me the money to kickstart this venture. We hadn't really talked since our initial conversation, and on paper, it was an absolutely crazy investment. I mean, I was newly married, 27 years old, with a nine-month-old daughter coming off the crash of a business, sitting a quarter million dollars in debt with a foggy business idea that was only a few hours old. In an industry, mind you, I had no experience in. But when I finally, I guess, mustered up the courage to ask him what his deciding factor was for lending me the money, he paused and said, I wasn't investing in the business. I was investing in you. And at that moment, I discovered that you never know the value of your relationships until you really need them. And that when you hit rock bottom in life, and we all do at one point in time and another, you'll be left with two things, the integrity of your word and the strength of your relationships. So never tarnish your word and always invest in your relationships because in the end, that's all we really have. Now, most don't invest in relationships because they can't peg an ROI to them. But as Steve Jobs famously said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You just need to trust that they'll somehow connect in your future. Sometimes you need to drown out the noise and take what feels like a leap of faith. A leap of faith like I did in 2011 when I spent $10,000 to go to Tim Ferriss' OTK event. Did I see ROI ultimately? You better believe it, right? That event fundamentally changed the trajectory of my life. Without a doubt, I can confidently say that because it's been six years. I can now look back and connect the dots backwards. If it wasn't for that event in 2011, I wouldn't have met Michelle, who was the one who posted on Facebook that she had a free ticket to go see Seth Godin. If it wasn't for that Seth Godin event in New York City, I would have never started hosting Mastermind Dinners. If I didn't start Mastermind Dinners, I would have never discovered my passion for connecting and connecting with fascinating entrepreneurs. With that discovery, I had the desire to connect people on a larger scale, which gave me the confidence to take advantage of the opportunity to buy the 4,000 copies of Tim Ferriss's books. Tim's books led to the creation of MMT, where we had 11 people who I met at that OTK event come out to support, five as speakers who didn't charge me a fee, and six as paid attendees, two of which ended up signing up for my $20,000 a year retreat program after the event.
If you were to calculate what I would have paid in speaker fees and the lost revenue from these six first year attendees, the ROI from that one event totaled well over $145,000. That doesn't even take into account that many of those six original attendees have renewed every year for the last five years. It doesn't take into account the amount of people they've nominated for MMT. It doesn't take into account the doors that they've opened for me. And it also doesn't take into account that the $84,000 investment that was given to me at my deepest time of despair, which kickstarted this whole damn thing, came from somebody that I also met at that event. Looking at the original attendee list from that event in 2011, out of the 127 people in attendance, 48 have become friends of mine, people who I feel comfortable enough to reach out to for advice, for feedback, for connections, for resources, with eight of those people becoming some of my best friends. In my opinion, you can forget your real estate, your stocks, or even your fancy cryptocurrencies. Relationships are the ultimate asset. The melancholy of old age is that you can't make old friends. But as the saying goes, that Chinese proverb, which is really well known, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. My life is virtually unrecognizable from a few short years ago on every level. And in this season of the Community Made Podcast, I am holding nothing back. I promise you, I'm sharing real field tested philosophies and methodologies that will enable you to authentically grow and nurture relationships with that will not only impact your business, but profoundly impact your life as well. I can promise you that. Hey! So welcome to season two, how to grow, nurture and amplify your business relationships. This season, you'll be hearing from catalysts and super connectors and some of the world's best relationship builders from networking tips for introverts to how to befriend billionaires best practices for nurturing and deepening your most important business relationships and everything in between with that said here's a little sneak peek as to what to expect from this season of community made we know the question that's going to be on the test today tomorrow and for the rest of your life and that question is so what do you do or some very similar question to that. And yet we know the question on the test and we don't prepare, we don't practice. I have been able to build a lot of relationships with um, speakers or mentors just by being not the most excited person in the room, but being the most attentive person in the room. Using my skill set to provide value to someone else has opened up doors that I never dreamed could be opened with any amount of money. I have consistently seen it where the people who operate at the highest levels are like, it's just a constant mission of who's my, like, where's my next, where's my next mentor going to come from? It's this insatiable appetite for just wanting to be around the best. Yeah. I mean, I'd been running my team building and training business, uh, Dovetail Team Building and Training for about three years. And I kind of got to a point where I wanted to surround myself with more awesome women in particular. You know, I have great friends in the city, but none of them are really entrepreneurs. And I saw these women from afar and I, I knew a couple of them a little bit. And I was like, how do I get to actually hang out with these women. What I'm working on now is making it a gathering of tribes. So this is like a meta tribe of all these smaller tribes that are already cohesive, that are already connected to show up so that people don't feel alone. And I do think that's an area for a lot of people, especially if you're looking to develop relationships with influencers. Like finding a way to give them constructive feedback on something can be a great way to develop a relationship and, and set yourself up to look like a peer of theirs and somebody they'll want to interact with more because you're telling them something that no one else is. I can't think of anything more important when you're a connector than just sitting back and listening to what people have to say, what they're passionate about, what they're trying to do, what their challenges are, and then using that connector mentality that you have to just figure out how can I help them? Literally, I do it selfishly because I'm fascinated. I'm like, at the end of the day, I get a high off of seeing people tell me about the things that they love to do and create. And that's just me. And maybe that's not for everybody, but like, I just have an addiction to being around people that are passionate about what they're creating in the world. I mean, even now, you know, these dinners aren't like overly strategic. Like we are expecting, you know, X amount of business deals to happen or for us to get anything out of it. So no, but we just know the value of bringing people together. I mean, I think all the good things for our life have come from the relationships. We you have. can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Hey! 
So that's it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. I can't wait to roll out season two to you. It is, it's gold. I gotta say, I'm super happy with how it turned out. It's a monster of a season, but it's honestly some of my best work. In the next episode, I share why proximity is power, the findings of the longest study in adult development history, which has been going on for over 75 years now, conducted by Harvard, and why your friends are making you fat. I know it sounds harsh, but it's based in science. I share more in the next episode for show notes and any additional resources. Visit the Community Made group. If you're not a member, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. In there, we give away free books. We host special trainings and live Q&As. Also, this season is just filled with additional resources like checklists and stuff like that. And the only way to get access to that is via the group. So again, visit communitymade.com. If you enjoyed this episode, nothing would make me happier than hearing your thoughts or your biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynard or email me at Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N at communitymade.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, I would be forever grateful if you got the word out by sharing it with a friend, rating it on iTunes, or leaving a review. With that said, I got to give a special shout out to Lee for leaving the following review, which was, every episode is gold. I can't say enough about how great each episode is. Each guest has a world of wisdom, and every episode flows great. I can't wait to hear what each new episode has in store. Again, we have some amazing episodes in the works, Lee, so stand by for that. And as a quick side note, this just popped in my head because I know Lee is actually attending one of our upcoming workshops. So we decided to launch, actually we were planning just to do one workshop in relation to how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. But I announced it simply on my personal Facebook page and it sold out within a day and a bit which caught me by surprise. I honestly was not expecting this, this level of response. So we decided to announce a second date for the workshop. It's a two-day workshop taking place in Toronto. So to check dates and availability, go to superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnectorworkshop.com. Again, if you love what we're talking about in season two of the podcast, We'll be deep diving uh, on a lot of those concepts live in that workshop. So superconnectorworkshop.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you on episode two.